Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today I have the great privilege of welcoming two guests to the channel. One you've seen many times before in Ralph Ellis. The second, Vocab Malone, who is a Christian apologist. And today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Today we're going to have a discussion on the chronology of the Gospels and the historicity of Jesus. Now, these two gents have never met or spoken before, so this is the first time they're actually speaking. So, starting with Vocab. Vocab, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Vocab. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, United States of America, originally from Columbus, Ohio. And um, my background is kind of artsy stuff, you know, underground hip-hop, slam poetry, uh, graffiti art, stuff like that. And then... Um, there was just natural transition. The more uh, serious I became about uh, my Christian faith and the Christian faith, I would talk to people about it and have conversations, and they would bring up things, and I would study them. And it led from kind of just reading about it to next thing I know I'm in school and go here and go there. Ended up at Phoenix Seminary and some other stuff like that. And uh, then started doing blogging transition from blogging into the radio and the whole time i would be doing a lot of stuff out on the street just talking to people and stuff mainly on the campuses college area and uh from blogging to the radio then to youtube and uh social media doing stuff on there and so when i'm not at work that's usually what i'm doing on my channel street apologist and uh or someone else's and um uh that's that's I guess that's pretty much it. Yeah, I think that works. Okay, and Ralph, um, I know my subscribers and viewers are quite familiar with you, but in return, could you just do the same? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> yeah, good to be with you again. Um, yeah, so yeah, Ralph Ellis, who am I? Uh, author of uh, twelve books uh, on biblical and historical subjects um old testament new testament my goal in life because i've been a lifelong atheist uh, ever since the age of seven i suppose something of that nature um my i was never satisfied with the stories we've been given there was simply enough not enough historicity within them so i began looking for the real history that underlies or should underlie the gospel and the um biblical stories um and i think i've found a lot of it because otherwise you've only got a couple of options either this is all mythology as the mythicists will like to say you know it's all been made up or uh you accept it just verbatim because you know the books are there so just believe the books i've sort of trod a sort of mid path between the two thinking that there has to be some historical context behind the books that have been written. Um, but since we can't easily find these characters in the historical record, I went looking for them. And I do think I found pretty much all of the um, characters within the biblical record in the historical record. And they're more or less exactly the same as the biblical texts say. The only difference is most of them are rather more important than the biblical biblical texts make out so they are real kings um, and real leaders of real peoples so they are pharaohs of egypt they are kings of you know uh, syria and judea like the king of edessa and there is a lot of information to back that up um, not going to get into any detail but just for one little illustration uh, josephus flavius says that the um Israelites were the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. Now there is a positive link back into real history, and that's the sort of real history I've been exploring. Thanks, Ralph. So the chronology of the Gospels and the historicity of Jesus. Um, well, uh, well, Yes, if I if I make my uh, side clear, then that might explain to vocab uh, the differences between us, because I, I've no doubt the vocab is taking the uh, classical chronology of of the New Testament. 
Um, so my new chronology of the uh, New Testament is based on data um, that you can pick up within the gospel story. And the main point being that the gospel story actually happened within the AD 50s. Well, no, actually the AD 60s um, instead of the AD 20s. So there's a 40 year chronological chasm, as I say. So my chronology is different to the classical. And there is good reason for thinking that. Um, I mean, for instance, we have um, the murders of um, Zacharias Barakias or Baruch, <clears throat> which Jesus mentions as being a very specific murder between the altar and the temple. Um, and he laments the, uh, the murder of this guy. Well, that is a fairly well-known murder. That was the murder of uh, Zacharias Baruch in AD 60s. Uh, he was one of the leaders of the Jewish revolt. And so we have a link there to a later date. We have Jesus describing Jerusalem surrounded by uh, a trench and a wall. That comes straight out of Josephus. It's a description of the siege of Jerusalem. And if Jesus is mentioning that, well, they say it's prophecy, of course, but if he's mentioning that, it's likely to be a later story, AD 60s story. Um, <clears throat> Jesus lament, no, he mocks um, Ben Zizit Hakesith um, in exactly the same manner as the Talmud does, which is okay. You know, he talks about his tassels and his cushions and all of this sort of business in the same manner that the Talmud does. But again, Ben Zizit Hakaseth is an AD 60s character. He is one of the leaders of the Jewish revolt. Um, and there are many more of these. Um, you know, Jesus became high priest of Jerusalem, he Hebrews 7. Um, that is easily linked up with Jesus of Gamala, uh, who is an AD 60s character. We have the research of... Uh, Robert Eisenman, Professor Robert Eisenman, who linked uh, Mary Bothus with Mary Magdalene, uh, which I concur with. I think that's a very good link. The trouble is that Mary Bothus married Jesus of Gamala, who became the high priest in AD 63, I think it was. So again, we're linking up the gospel story with the AD 60s. So I don't know if you want me to go on, but you've got, a, you've got an idea here that we might be talking about an AD 60s story rather than an AD 20s story. And the reason, the ultimate reason for this different chronology is that the Jesus character is linked to the Jewish revolt. So we all know that Jesus was some sort of revolutionary. He was jailed alongside um, revolutionaries who had committed murder in the revolution and then you have to ask yourself well what revolution was that and the answer in my books of course is that was the jewish revolt of ad 66 to ad 70. so we're talking about a, a much later date and that jesus was one of the leaders of the jewish revolt and that's why his story is so much more important than if he was a mere carpenter back in the 1830s. So uh, I think that sort of sets the scene. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, the Gospels uh, do, fortunately, give us some good uh, places to sink our teeth in as far as dates go. And um, when we add not only the Gospel data, Synoptics plus John, we also, of course, have Acts, sequel to Luke. And then we have the epistles, uh, primarily Paul, but not just Paul, of course, James and Jude and a number of others. And even to a certain extent, the apocalypse, the revelation, has some dating elements in, in it as well. So when we take those markers plus what we know about Second Temple Judaism— plus some interesting archaeological elements, plus the development of Christianity as we look at early church history. When we uh, look at that, we have a story that fits pretty snugly, pretty tightly within a, a small window, a small frame. 
<clears throat> there's not a lot of leeway. There's not a lot of room to play with there. There's things here and there that could be adjusted or tweaked, or we might have questions about and things like that. Sometimes it comes from gaps in our, what we may call uh, secular or extra biblical history. But the kind of um, slides that Mr. Ellis is talking about seem uh, really beyond the pale of what is possible. And it's, and what we have going on is if we, if we want to take certain elements serious and say, well, this writer mentioned this person and that lines up with Josephus here. We really got to develop a stern methodology when we know to take a character, say, in the gospel seriously, but not the date, and when we need to take the date seriously. Uh, so I'm hoping by the end of the conversation, I'll have an understanding, the audience will have an understanding of how it is Mr. Ellis determines which times we take what data seriously because you know jesus's birth slot you could say birth year but the time jesus is born the things that happen there along with the crucifixion along with things that are mentioned in acts but even when they look back on certain dates when you have certain rulers that only ruled at certain times and uh all that going on together well here we go in this window we're sliding it over here on Mr. Ellis's schema, why do we take certain things as that's correct? So like the character of Jesus, he seems to say, okay, the character, uh, he is this and that, but he's also this and that, which of course, like he said, is more important than the gospels let on. Same thing with Paul, from what I've heard uh, Mr. Ellis say, unless I'm mistaken, I, uh, I heard, I heard it, and I, I, it's hard to sometimes grasp it. That's what he really is saying, that Paul is actually Josephus, Things like that. Okay, um, why do we take some of the some of the data series, but not the other data? So I'm just hoping we can come to a uh, not not just a stern, but a robust and consistent methodology, because I think that'll really help understand uh, how he gets the conclusions that he gets. That'll help me understand. Okay, based upon what methodology, because we all know when we do history, there's historiography, and so there's an art and a science to that, and uh, there's there's um, not there's practices that have been developed not just for the sake of tradition or something like that but to to ensure professionalism and and prevent uh sloppy errors by by anybody i'm not just i'm not saying the person i'm talking to i'm just saying for all for all of us as we've evolved to try to uncover the past and understand what's really there and so that's what i hope i can understand because the gospels give us a lot of dates and a lot of places to hang our hats on and uh if we if we start to mess with around mess around with it's not like we can just take it like a mobile home on a trailer and just remove it to another place. It's a whole thing of dominoes where it creates all kinds of other problems. I just want to I want to understand okay how do we get that not others you know for example Jesus is referred to in Timothy as giving a good cash, confession before Pontius Pilate. That's Paul writing to Timothy in Ephesus. So then you also have. The four gospels, so that's four, at least four separate sources saying he's crucified under the reign of Pontius Pilate during the time of Tiberius Caesar, when you add that up as well. That's just one element. And so we have multiple sources pointing to this singular event. Well, if we're going to slide that all the way over, way over here, we have to have awfully good reason to be able to do that. And it has to be based upon a consistent methodology. So that'd be one of the key things I would say is, you know, the crucifixion of Jesus is sort of a benchmark that a lot there's a lot of agreement on. And forget about, you know, a year or two or a day or two. If we're going to slide it over decades, we need to have awful good reasons and be able to pick up all the pieces that come from the fallout of doing something like that. Agreed. Uh, yes, yeah, shall, I, shall I just jump in there again there, Esoteric? Yeah, okay, I, I got the thumbs up, yep. Um, yes, good points, uh, I fully agree. Um, we we need to have good reason for redating the uh, gospel story. Um, and I think there are some good reasons. I mean, the primary good reason is that all of these people are missing from the historical record. So we're working from a big lacuna to start with. We don't know who Saul is. He doesn't appear in the um, historical record. We don't know who Jesus is. He doesn't appear in the historical record. 
Uh, and so we have to start looking for these characters. And you've only got a couple of options. Either they're mythical, um, or perhaps we're looking in the wrong era or the wrong location for them, if we want to find them in the historical record. Um, so yes, you, you have these dates which Christianity has, has made canonical because they are accepted. Um, but there are no real, apart from, and I'll give you this, apart from the appearance of Pontius Pilate, there are no good dates within the New Testament uh, narrative. Um, so what do we have? We have uh, the birth in 86, that's probably correct, but that wouldn't alter the story because it would just mean he was much older when he was crucified. The crucifixion, yes, we have the gospel story that this happened under Pontius Pilate, um, but of course, we have the story from Josephus that the three leaders of the Jewish revolt were crucified in AD 70 outside the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, they were taken down early by Josephus himself, and two of them died and one of them survived. It is a perfect parallel for the, the passion story, the crucifixion of Jesus. And of course, the person who took them down from the cross was Josephus Flavius. And the father of Josephus was called Matthias. And so a lot of people, including myself, understand that Joseph Arimathias, Arimathea could well be um, Josephus Flavius because his father was called Matthias. So he was Josephus Ben Matthias they have very, very similar appellations. And so we have a crucifixion story, but this is not the, the traditional AD 30s story. This is the AD 70s, AD 70 exact. So we have a parallel story. So how does that affect the rest of the gospel story? Well, you mentioned the epistles, of course, um, and there is a problem with the epistles. The epistles don't have the full crucifixion narrative. Now, Saul, uh, when he was on his uh, tours around the Mediterranean, he would have been lamenting, you know, this, this tragic crucifixion of Jesus um, and the full crucifixion story. But he doesn't. We don't get the full story within the epistles. All we get is a couple of mentions here and there of crucifixion, which are tacked on to the end of uh, verses. Uh, but that's not what he would have been doing. He would have been lamenting this, this tragic event and giving all of the details of the crucifixion event. You know, the as everybody knows, you know, all the way from the trial all the way through to the crucifixion and the women around the cross and the the sponge and the spear everything that is to do with that crucifixion story he would have been mentioning but he doesn't the epistles are they simply miss out that story and the reason in my view that they miss out this story is because it hadn't happened yet it happened in ad 70 and we have that story from Josephus Flavius. And therefore, what they're talking about, if they're talking about any resurrection, um, which there are a couple of mentions of resurrection, of course, they, they're just talking about a, um, a death and rebirth cult, exactly the same as masonry is today. So I have been, I have died and I have been reborn in exactly the same fashion. And of course, Lazarus did exactly the same. Lazarus was, died and was reborn in exactly the same fashion. And so you could talk about the resurrection of Lazarus in exactly the same manner uh, as the epistles talk about the resurrection of Jesus in exactly the same fashion. So the chronology does work. We have a birth of Jesus. I put it either AD 6, which is the traditional date, of course, for the birth of Jesus, perhaps AD 14, because of the royal family I link him to. Um, the epistles, well, that's, you know, the work of Saul, of course, going across the Mediterranean, that would be the AD 50s. That is classical uh, chronology, all the same. And then the events of uh, Jesus's mission 
and his uh, crucifixion would have been between AD 66 and AD 70 and the events of the Jewish revolt. And of course, the people who were involved in the Jewish revolt, if we look at the historical side of this, uh, the people involved uh, were Jesus, Jesus of Gamala, Jesus Sophias, uh, as narrated by Josephus Flavius. And these are obvious parallels to the biblical story, to the gospel story, that he's actually talking about Jesus of Gamala, who was one of the leaders of the Jewish revolt. Remember, it was Jesus of Gamala who we think married uh, Mary Bothus, who is Mary Magdalene, uh, as per the Talmud. Um, so again, we get all of these links pointing towards the 80s, 60s. So the chronology does work. I mean, it's a different chronology, but it does work. Yeah, so... Um... <clears throat> Josephus says that he knew these crucifixion victims. Yes. So you believe that uh, then Jesus uh, knew not only Josephus, but that also uh, that means that uh, Jesus would have known the Apostle Paul? Yes, yeah, because he was Josephus Flavius. As you know, I link Saul and Josephus Flavius. Okay, so... Um, and so, yes, he would have known him. But remember, uh, their main meeting was in the 1860s, which was after the epistles had already been written. So the epistles so... were written in the 1850s. If Josephus, a.k.a. Paul, um, was responsible for getting Jesus off the cross— why would Paul proclaim the resurrection, which would indicate that Jesus died and rose again, as he wrote about in 1 Corinthians 15? If he's the one who got him off the cross, then why would he be a proclaimer of the resurrection? Because the first resurrection was a symbolic resurrection, the same as Lazarus was. So Lazarus was resurrected before Jesus, and that was in exactly the same symbolic uh, resurrection, exactly as, as the same as I've been resurrected. I had a resurrection many years ago. Were you on a cross, me. though, Mr. Ellis? Not on, a, no, not on a cross, but I was resurrected as a third-degree Freemason. I know, but I mean, cruci crucifixion is uh, something we know about. You know, there's archaeological sources. For example, oh, yes. you probably know the guy who you know, had the spike driven through his foot and they couldn't get it out. And so, you know, they had to take that, uh, take part of his foot with the spike and then the wood is still there. You know, we've got this, right? Uh, that's not symbolic. That crap hurts, right? No, and so that's both. why, but I mean, that's why Josephus would ask the general to come down off, to get these guys off the cross because they were his buddies, yes. right? So that that wasn't symbolic. You know, no, but, Josephus but is in writing a history. Yeah. yeah, I know, but I'm saying you said you had a resurrection, but you're talking about something symbolic and Lazarus and all that. I'm saying he they go off the cross. These other two men die yes. that are pulled off a cross, so they're actually dead. But why would Paul then say, I preach Christ and him crucified, and why would he write a whole chapter on the resurrection? And why would he say that if there's no resurrection, we're to be pitied? And why would Paul say that I didn't – my priority is not even to baptize in 1 Corinthians 1, but it's to preach Christ. Why would um, Paul be someone who stands both for the Athenians, the Stoic and Epicureans, who he knows have a derision for the physical body, and then proclaim the resurrection to them, which Luke records is why they derided him? But some heard him, the Bible says in, in Acts right there. Why would he do that at the Areopagus if he actually knows I'm the one responsible for getting Jesus pulled off the cross so he could survive? Why would Paul then proclaim his resurrection? I'm still not understanding that. Well, because there were two resurrections, of course. The AD 50s, he could not be, uh, under my chronology, he could not be talking about the real crucifixion uh, because that happened, hadn't happened yet. But all we get within the epistles is little tiny mentions of crucified, which don't actually make much sense. I mean, you look at Galatians 5.24, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with affections and lusts. Quite obviously, the word is not being used in the right fashion there. That's not a real crucifixion. They're using the word storu um, as being uh, to, to crucify someone, to, to uh, 
um, to persecute someone. They and they that are Christ have persecuted the flesh with affections and lusts. That's not talking about a real crucifixion. And all of these uh, mentions within the epistles are just little add-ons. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Well, that's not talking about the crucifixion, but we preach cruci... I can't even say my words now. Uh, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Well, that's not the crucifixion story. This is just mentions of crucifixion which have been misinterpreted or interpolated into the text and there are only one two three four five six seven eight okay, but nine, mr ellis mr ten. ellis in philippians 2 the way the apostle paul writes about jesus is this he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross so what you did there is you took some of the passages where Paul makes uh, Christians through our unific through our, through our union in Christ, uh, in a sense, symbolically die with him. But it's based upon his real death. So what do you do here with this passage? And this isn't the only one. We could go to others. You were able to mention a couple. I, I could mention uh, quite a few as well, where it says he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Does that sound figurative to you? Because he says death on a cross there. Yes, but all of those are tacked on to the end of verses, aren't they? Uh, no, they're not. They're not. So in, in Greek, you know, there's no periods, of course. There's no yeah. punctuation. And so to say something is tacked on doesn't make sense unless it's totally, uh, you know, has nothing to do with the context. And the context of Philippians 2, it's called the Carmen Christi, is that Paul is telling these Philippians, you need to have one mind in Christ. And then he says Christ was humbled. And then he goes on to explain the humility of Christ. So he uses the death of Christ as an object lesson for how the Philippians should treat each other. It's based upon Christ's real death. So that's not tacked. This is in the centerpiece of his argument here in the Carmen Christi. So this is not something that's tacked on. If you're going to say it's tacked on, Mr. Ellis, you would need to you know, do something like present some textual data to say, look, in our earliest copy of Philippians, this verse is absent. All the mentions of the cross are absent, but actually the opposite is true. If you've ever been able to look at the work of Larry Hurtado, he showed when he was alive, he was at Edinburgh, he showed how the early early Christian scribes, whenever they um, wrote the name of Christ in Greek, they abbreviated it with something called a starogram, which is they made the shape of the cross in the Greek letters by abbreviating his name. It's quite a fascinating thing. I encourage the audience to look it up. In English, it's S-T-A-U-R-O-G-R-A-M, I believe, and Larry Hurtado. He's not the only one, but he's done the most in-depth work on this. And so this is something the early Christians understood, even the copyists themselves. And so it, it's not tacked on. The textual data is the opposite, is that it has quite a long train of succession about a literal death of Jesus. And here in Philippians 2, it says even death on a cross. So how would – what makes you claim that that's tacked on to Philippians 2 when it's literally the centerpiece of his argument? Well, it's not because it says um... – and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Okay, symbolic death, the same death as I've had. Well, well, where is it symbolic, some, though? Where, where are you getting symbolic from? Because there is no uh, crucifixion story here. Saul was running around the Mediterranean trying to get new adherents uh, to his new church and also getting money to them. Uh, from them, as he says on many occasions. Okay. And he would have been explaining the full crucifixion story, the trial, the scourging, carrying the cross, um, being wait, put wait, on wait. the cross, the, the people around the cross, all of those details, which you know very well, uh, he never mentions within the epistles. Well, hold on. It's, hold on. There's a lot there you're, you're saying, but we're it's, it's just sliding by, but it should be challenged. I mean, honestly speaking, uh, Paul does then mention some deep. Paul does, that's, that's what I'm going to do. That's why I wanted to make sure we could stop there. Paul <clears> does <throat> mention some of those details, number one. I've already brought up in the beginning. He specifically mentions the historical figure of Pontius Pilate. And, and even you understand Pontius Pilate is a real historical figure rooted in a oh, certain yes. time. For he says to Timothy that he gave the good confession, uh, for example. Then I show you in Philippians, you have death and his cross right there. 
uh, that's the, the, that's not the but only the thing. I'm going to show you some the others. The end of the verse. It's the but end notice, of that little section. Notice when I began my my basic chronology. I said so. The gospel data, and I mentioned Acts. I mentioned the Apocalypse, Revelation. So I'll notice I'm also mentioning the genres of literature. I said the epistles, primarily by Paul. Mm. I know. You you read, you know the difference in genres. So you know Paul's writing epistles. These are occasional letters. And you know that the point is not to do what the gospelers did. The point is to build upon what they did. And so that's not his intention is to retell the whole gospel story. But no, nonetheless, I pointed out several times where he does retell the important points. We know, for example, Paul had access to, to Luke because he quotes the gospel of Luke and Timothy and, and refers to it. As, as scripture along with a portion of Torah. And so he puts them together. He literally quotes Jesus in regards to muzzle not the ox. Now here we go to something that I just don't see how you can make symbolic. This is in Colossians 1.20. We've already got death on the cross. Now we have Jesus making peace by the blood of the cross. So in Colossians 1.20, if it's symbolic, Mr. Ellis, why does it say the blood of the cross? We've already got death on the cross. Now we've got blood of his cross. The verse is Colossians 1.20. Mm -hmm. Why does he say blood of the cross if it's merely symbolic? And that's not talk, tacked on again. You have no evidence that it would be tacked on. You'd have to demonstrate that, not just tell us. But he says, making peace by the blood of his cross. Then in Colossians 2, he says, the, this he set aside. This is verse 14, nailing it to the cross. So right there in his letter to the church of Colossae, he says, blood. Of the cross, then a chapter later, and I know the chapters are later, um, but I'm saying I'm just giving reference here. In two fourteen, he says, nailing it to the cross. So, Mr. Ellis, how do you have the Apostle Paul writing about blood on the cross, nailing it to the cross in the beginning of his letter to the church Colossae? How can you say that's symbolic? What do you do with blood on the cross and nailing it to the cross? That sounds very physical, doesn't it? It's still not the crucifixion story. The crucifixion story is missing from all of the epistles. You've you've just found the word storos. That's all you've found. No, no, you I found the word blood and death, Mr. Ellis. Please don't please don't minimize what I found for you. I also found blood and death. How do you deal with blood? Why why did Jesus have blood on the cross, Mr. Ellis? Well, who's saying that it means cross? That's been interpreted as cross, but it's just storos. Uh, it can mean to establish, to stand. Why is there blood then on the storos? Well, I'm sure that many people write about blood. I mean, that's that proves nothing. You, you, okay, why you did he found, why did he nail? Why was he nailed to the Storos in Colossians two? In Colossians two. Colossians two fourteen. It says nailing it to the cross, which is the end of the verse again. Nailed to cross is the end. Of the Mr. Verse Ellis, you're under the impression that the period in English indicates the end of the verse. It does not. It's not uh, the end of it's not the end of the verse. Well, it's I'm, the I'm, end of I'm, the English sentence, sure. Yeah, I'm reading in the, in the Greek as well. But do you see a period in the Greek, Mr. Ellis? Uh, no, I see verses, and the it's... verses are inserted later by an Englishman. They're helpful reference markers, but you know very well Paul didn't put one fourteen two fourteen. So I'm asking you about you can't just evade everything no, by saying written, it's tacked it on. Written in sentences. Let's not let's not talk about tacked on. Let's talk about nailed on. Why is this person being nailed to the cross, Mr. Ellis? If it's symbolic, it's it's the as I say it's the end end of the verse again. You you cannot write. <laughs> nobody nobody in that era, even in the Greek, uh, wrote a slab of text without any punctuation, without any separation into sentences. Well, yes, they uh, did. Well, well, hold on, the, Mr. Ellis, we might be displaying uh, a lack of information here. The earliest manuscripts, you should know, are all in capital Greek letters with no spaces. Mm -hmm. You just told us no one did that. It's the opposite. They were crunched together to save space in the earliest manuscripts. All of our earliest manuscripts, when it comes to the Greek, are all capitals, and there, there are no spaces. And Bar Ehrman, even, for example, he showed this, where you can uh, sometimes have trouble in translating because he gives an English example, God is now here or God is nowhere. You have to know where to divide it because there are not even spaces. So you're saying something that goes against the textual data. But leaving that aside, why do you need to be nailed if the cross is not real? I'm going to bring up the Greek right no, now. I'm going to show everybody what you're saying you, is not accurate. You're, you're misinterpreting here because you look at the next verse and it starts as a beginning of a sentence and it will start like that within the Greek as well. Um, 
not even in the Greek would someone actually read the text, even when it was written like that, they wouldn't read it as a block of text. They would have breathing spaces, which we call sentences. And the next sentence is obviously a breathing space. It's quite obvious. The, the breathing, though, there actually are breathing marks, but they're notated in Greek. Mm. And it's not it's obvious awesome. that, no, no, it's not. For example, like, uh, like you have the, in the ha, you have that going on. That's a definite article, ha. Yeah, but what what you're saying is not accurate. This is not how Greek readers interpret it. This is not how they understood it. So you can't avoid it. So here's what's happening. It seems you're admitting nailing to the cross is an actual, real, physical thing because you don't need to get nailed if it's not a cross. But to avoid a disruption to your your theory, you're telling us it's tacked on. Do you have any textual data to show us Colossians 2, verse 14, is missing in some early New Testament manuscripts? If you do, then we can have an interesting conversation about that. But I have Metzer's textual commentary in front of me. I have Comfort's textual commentary, and uh, I have his list of early papyri, all that right here. But I don't see any evidence that we have a some kind of major variant in 2.14 where nailing is left out. So you can't just assert that it's included later. Why would you do that? Well, because you, you're operating on an English translation and not the Greek. And... Oh, can I can I show the audience the Greek, please? I have it. Yes, Am I allowed to share my screen? I would like to show that I'm not operating in the way that you indicated. Okay, is everyone? I'm I'm not sure. I'm trying to see what you you are seeing here. What are you guys able to see? We can see the screen. Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, let me make sure it's the right, the right. It's not showing what I need to show here. It's showing, uh, can you see? Hold on. Let me, uh, I want to show you here uh, this. Well, actually, can I just grab my Greek New Testament? Let me just grab my Greek New I'll just show you physically. Hold on. Because I wasn't able to share my screen. It's I have it up in Logos, but... So you're saying that that I'll I'll see what you're saying, right? If I look at it in Greek, but what about the Greek will change? What will change the conclusion here? How will how will the Greek show me that nailed is not actually there or something like that? How will that how will that work? Hello? But Can you guys the, hear me? The next verse is obviously a breathing space. I mean, that's, that's pretty obvious from the way you he read He disarmed the rulers and authorities? Sorry? It says he disarmed the rulers and authorities. Uh, sorry, which, which verse are you talking about now? Colossians 2.14. Uh, yeah, how, I've got that. Okay, but, but, but you understand there's if you're, if you're going to use this idea of there's breathing spaces— which is not really the way they add the periods in the Greek. It's based upon the, the understanding of where a thought concludes or begins. Well, but if you're going to add that... Because verse, verse 14 obviously ends at the end of that verse because the next verse is talking about something else. Therefore, there is a breathing space, whether it's marked in the text or not. Wait, what? Uh, but but, well, but how does that mean that, is, how does that mean it wasn't there originally? Nailing to the cross is not linked to spoiled principalities and powers, as it's uh, translated into the English. That's clearly a, a new topic. And so, therefore, it will be read as a new topic. And so the previous verse is the end of the previous topic. That's, that's the only way you can read it. But what you still haven't done is you still haven't shown us a complete crucifixion story within the epistles why is that missing from the epistles it's missing because it happened hadn't happened yet so all you have within the epistles is a couple of mentions of resurrection because jesus has had a symbolic resurrection the same as lazarus and you see a few mentions of a cross some of which are mistranslated um quite obviously so that they shouldn't be uh, translated as a uh, cross and the others have just been tacked on, but there is no crucifixion story. Surely you must you must see that. No. Okay. So uh, so there it is in Greek. It should be showing now. It's showing now. Yeah. Okay. So do you see? Do you guys see the blue highlighted sentence there? Yes. So that's Colossians two fourteen. Mm -hmm. 
Can you still see it? I'm moving up and I'm trying to make it bigger. I, I can't see exactly what you're seeing, the way it operates. Yeah. No, okay. No, we we can see that. Okay. Okay. Good. Do you see that? That's star on there. Yep. Right there. Star. Yeah. So we got that. Yep. Buildings and structures. Okay. So uh, click on it again so everyone can see the translations. Yeah. Right there. Buildings and structures, uh, cultural ontology across was a means of execution. Okay, so that's their translation. A that's criminal would be staked to a cross by the hands and feet and hung up to die by asphyxiation. Okay, right? So you, you saw that? Yep. Okay. And uh, where wh I'm trying to find what you're saying is the, the key here that's going to help me understand. Because uh, the verse 15 is not linked to verse 14. It's talking about a different subject. So it doesn't matter whether there's a full stop there or not. They're talking about a different subject in verse 15. Therefore, it is a different verse. Okay. Right before it, it says, You who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcised your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven, uh, having forgiven us all our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them in open shame by triumphing over them in him. So notice the triumph. Bringing it to the cross, yes. Not really talking about, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 know it's, I know it's here. That's why I wanted to bring us here. But notice the victory is tied in directly with Jesus by triumphing over them in hen it's not really talking about the crucifixion of jesus though is it it's saying blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing nailing it to his cross oh so it's That's... so so is it tacked on or is it that i misunderstood the verse which one is it whichever you like but it's not the crucifixion <laughs> story no, so, so, so uh, see so i knew show, it was show here. me Show Remember what spear. I said? Th Come Paul on. ties in our our cancellation of our debt. No, all this is this is gospel, so you know this. Mm -hmm. Ties in our cancellation of our debt with the very real death of Jesus Christ. That's how our debt is canceled. And so here there is Jesus that is actually dying, as we've already shown from Colossians one. And and don't forget, right up here, it says right before that, it says God who raised him from the dead, verse twelve. It says the powerful working God who raised him from the dead. So when you take it all together, you have yeah, this obvious tie-in with the Christians with what happened on the cross. No, the symbolic element is that our trespasses are nailed as well, but it's based upon Jesus being nailed. And that's why the nailing is important. The metaphor of the cross is directly related. So this is talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, but it's tied in practically with what the Christians have as well. And that's why the end of the sentence says, by triumphing over them in him. So it is talking about Christ. So see the in him right here in blue. Do you see in blue right there that I've got it highlighted right here where the cursor is? Mm -hmm. Altus in atau. My pronunciation is not always perfect, but I know where I'm at in the text. So there you have them triumphing over them in him. And it's based upon what in he it did. Is the translation I have in it, not him. That's Wait, the, by triumphing. Um, over what are you on 215 no i'm on uh, the king james version and the king james translates that as it not him let's see let's go to let's go to clash 215 the kjv see if that's right and what do you believe that would indicate if that's the case well i, I don't want to get tied up too much in this um because we're obviously at loggerheads you can't show me the crucifixion story in the epistles and i can't explain every single uh, verse that's there in the epistles. But here's a question for you, just to go off. Well, Mr. On a Ellis, I just want to show what you did, though. Well, first just, you just, just assumed it was tacked one. on. Hold on, Volker. Okay. Hold on, okay. When you looked hold into on. it, you said, okay. "Oh, I'm misinterpreting it." Okay. You know, that's hold not on. really fair. But okay, let Ralph, let Ralph ask the question. Just, okay. just um, uh, on a slight tangent, looking at Lazarus, would you say that that is uh, symbolic or a real resurrection? Neither recitation. Because Lazarus did not go on to live forever, but he physically was risen again. But the technical term there would be recitation because he do, he does die again. 
but it's very physical. And this is, remember the beginning of this, I said, Mr. Ellis, I hope that you can sh share with the audience your methodology of how what you decide to take as a historical element or not. Because I remember you said once that you have 90% uh, of the Bible actually happening. You just shift, shifted the timeline. And the reason I bring that up is because here in the KJV, you might even remember this, says, hey, no, 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 no. Don't be going in there. Behold, he stinketh. It's been three days. So if mm -hmm. it's symbolic, why would he smell unless it's because of rigor mortis? Well, if if you had been locked into or decomposing, a tomb, I'm sorry. Go if ahead. you had been locked into a tomb for three days without a latrine, I think you would smell as well. So Lazarus was actually locked in there. So that's not symbolic then anymore, is it? Well, well, it's not because well, it's the symbolic death because you don't die. But as a mason, you are actually lowered into a tomb and you are assumed to be dead. But obviously, that's symbolic because you're not really dead. So you go through this. Um, this symbolic death and symbolic resurrection, the same as they used to do within Greece and Egypt and many other places. So, yeah, he would be locked into a tomb. It was a much more difficult um, exercise than we would go through within masonry because it would appear that they were actually stuck in a tomb for three days, which would be quite a, that would be quite um, a trial for you, locked into the darkness in a tomb that you cannot get out of right without the assistance of your fellows outside so you've got to be able to trust hmm. your people outside uh, do you have john eleven thirty seven in front of you do you, are we are we are you able to look at that is that Which up one? john eleven thirty seven it's the place uh with lazarus john eleven uh, let me look, thirty seven so i just want to make sure we're it's john chapter eleven verse thirty seven Verse 37. So notice that, um, you know, he, he was sick first in the account, but then you have two places, two places there where um, you have Mary say something that I think is mm -hmm. very significant. Do you see verse 32? Yeah. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Yes. And it's then symbolic, in yeah. John eleven thirty seven. It says, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Yeah. And then also verse 34 says, where have you laid him? So right there, you have multiple indications that he's dead and laid in a tomb. And the Greek word is there, we do have for, for tomb, uh, used multiple times. So yes. he's laid in it, though, because he was dead, but they wish Jesus could have prevented him from dying. So where are you getting the symbolism there? Well, I was dead as well. So do you regard my death as a real death? Or Did you a symbolic stink? Death? Sorry? Did you stink? Uh, I would have because done of decomposure to your tomb. body? If I'd been in a tomb for three days without a latrine, I'm sure I would have stunk, yes. Well, without a latrine, I'm not sure where you're getting that. You're reading a detail into the text that I'm not aware of. Well, Does it say tomb, that in here? If, you've, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you'll know that the tombs don't have uh, latrines in them. Therefore, Yes, be, I, I understand. My point is, though, you're, your own there's, there's stuff that's uh, – you're assuming he's alive, though. That's what's under question. Well, Why, yeah, why but, would you assume he's alive when the crowd says he could have prevented him from dying? And what they're also weeping, and then you have her say, if you would have came, my brother would not have died. Where's the indication he's locked in there? And well, a lot tombs, tombs had rolling stones, you know, all of the tombs that are yes, I know now. Yes, that actually is archaeological confirmation that the Absolutely. New Testament writers knew what they were talking about. But yeah, well, here, all of the tombs were like that. Yes, well, here, what I'm saying is, yes, in Jerusalem at that time specifically, but here's what I'm saying it says, My brother would not have died. Remember, he was sick prior to this. Why is you're on your upon your theory? Why is he locked in there? He's sick and now he's locked in there. Why? Who locked him in there? Because it's part of the symbolic initiation into a Masonic type sect. You will okay. go through this initiation, and this initi initiation involves wouldn't that be a good thing? being locked into a tomb, the same wouldn't as it be, I was locked into a tomb. It wouldn't be a good thing to get into the Masonic sect and do the initiation. Why is everybody crying and upset at Jesus then? Because these were secret societies. Not everybody would have known what uh, the significance of this was. So no one was in on the joke except for Lazarus and Jesus. 
oh, I'm sure the rest of the, well, even you know from the disciples, even the disciples didn't know what was going on. What did Jesus say about the disciples? Why do you not understand? Why do you hear and not understand? What did he say? What's that quote? I'm sure you can get that quote for me. Okay, so I want to focus again at the end of this, because every indication is that a man died and was risen again. John eleven forty four. the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips. This is all very physical, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus yeah. said to them, unbind him and let him go. Which is exactly how you come out of the tomb in a Masonic uh, third degree. You are hoodwinked. You okay. have a cloth over your face. So if nobody is aware of the joke, why does verse 46 and verse 45 say, or the ritual initiation rather, why does it say that many people believed on him after this event and then they wanted to kill Lazarus? Why does it say they believed on him if they didn't even understand it was a Masonic ritual? Well, because they probably thought it was real, that he'd actually come back to life. So they thought it was miraculous. So the audience thought it was real. Uh, the sisters thought it, they thought it was real. But you, Ralph Ellis, Jesus, and Lazarus are the only people who are aware that it was not actually real. Is anyone well, else aware of this? Well, we, we know that this was true, but that's why Jesus was talking in parables all the time, because he was talking on two levels. Um, that's why he says things like, you know, John 8, 43, why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot even hear my word? Um, it, it's quite obvious that even his disciples did not understand what was going on half the time, which is why he berated them on a number of occasions for this. So, yes, there, there were secrets that were being held from the rest of the congregation. Uh, because okay. this was an initiatory uh, church. You had to go through levels of initiation. Well, I, I, pre I thank you for giving your perspective and, and all that. I just, you have to understand, Ralph, for anyone else to share it, they would have to have publicly available information that could indicate to it. When you're, you indicate that that's the fact, when you're telling us that even the people who were there then didn't know what you know now. So this is difficult to understand. And I would bring our attention, so we don't just belabor there, to later on in this same passage of John 11, verse 49 says, but one of them, Caiaphas, was who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. And then he goes on and gives a speech. 